Okay, folks. A couple of reminders before you take off for spring break. One is your quizzes, if you haven't picked them up yet, are still upstairs. Frankly, I don't care if you pick them up or not. So if you feel that you don't need them, you've got your score, you don't care. I'll just leave them up and I hope they get thrown into recycling sometime over the spring break. I don't want to bring them into my office. I have absolutely no room for quizzes to build up. So if you want to pick them up, pick them up. If you don't, don't pick them up. No, either way, I'm okay with them. Um, second, I, as you well know, and I reminded you last session too, once you come back from spring break, you have a wait a week before you can send in your DCF. It's not for a grade. So again, if you choose to do your entire evaluation in week 14, I'm okay with that too. Okay. But don't send me your evaluation for feedback the day before it's due and say, can you get, because it's too late. It's not that I can't give it to you, but what are you going to do at that stage if I tell you, you've got to go back to scratch. So if you want the feedback, I need the DCFs in by the end of this month, which is about a week after you come back. It's, it's like 10 days, 11 days. So you got, you got until that Friday, but at least you, you know, start working on it. So today we're going to kind of complete the last few pieces of how to build a DCF model. And then we're going to start on what I call the loose sense evaluation. Sounds mysterious, but we're going to talk about what to do about cash, cross holdings, all the things you do after you tell me you're done in valuation and why it can get you into trouble. So to set the stage for that, I'm going to start today's class with a test about some of the things we're going to be looking at today. Now, the rule with cash often is don't mess with cash. Cash is cash. That said, though, there are a lot of people out there who look at cash and tell companies you made a terrible investment. And the basis is very simple. If you look at what's invested in cash and marketable securities, you look at a company like Google, 120 billion in cash and marketable securities, Apple, 200 billion, that's invested in like T-bills and commercial paper earning a low rate of return. That's a fact. 0.5%, 1%. But I think we've talked about this, but let's get this nailed down. There are analysts who look at that low rate of return and compare it to the cost of capital and say, look, you're making a half a percent. Your cost of capital is 8%. Therefore, this is a bad project. You're going to hear that. I want you to give me the counter. What's wrong with my reasoning? Because it clearly can't be true. Because if it's true, no company should ever have a cash balance, right? Cash is always going to earn a lower return than your cost of capital. What's wrong with my reasoning? And tell me how I can fix it. Yes. Uh, there's probably a very limited opportunity for very attractive That's That actually makes the case stronger for giving the cash back, right? If I have limited opportunities, why am I holding on to 120 billion in cash? That's not directly even confronting the, the point that I'm earning a low rate of return. Yep. Um, I was actually just going to ask if you could turn up the volume on your mic. It's a little bit hard to hear. I think it's a it's about at maximum volume. I don't think I can go much higher. Okay. So any other you want to try? What is it? Do you have your hand up? No. No. Okay. Anybody else want to try? Because yeah. Now we're going to go back to capital budgeting one hundred and one. When you look at a project, the discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of that project, right? So if I have a safe project, discount rate should be lower than if I have a risky project. What's cash invested in? Liquid and riskless investments. What rate of return should I demand on a liquid and riskless investment? Right now, it's about 0.4%. That's a table rate. Cash has a low rate of return because it's liquid and riskless. To hold it up against a cost of capital, that's what I should be earning on an operating investment, is comparing apples to oranges. Cash by itself is a neutral investment. It does nothing. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't help me. Today, we'll talk about when you might discount cash, but it's got nothing to do with the fact that it earns a low rate of return. Let's move forward. I'm going to test out a little bit of your accounting. Let's see how much of your accounting you remember. Let's assume you're valuing a company, a company A. It owns 60% of company B, and it has consolidated financial statements. I want you to think about what that means, because to answer this question, you need to understand what consolidation means. So I take operating income, I come up with three cash flows, I discount them back at the cost of capital, I come up with the value of the firm. Once I do that discounted cash flow valuation, how much of company B 
is going to show up in my final valuation. And I'll give you the choices. Maybe it's, none of it is in there. Maybe it's 60% because that's what I own. Maybe it's 100%. Or maybe it's what I don't own, 40%. What would make your life easiest is if it was exactly 60%, right? That's what you own. But when you consolidate, what do you do? Somebody describe the process of consolidation to me. What am I required to do in consolidation? Come on, your accounting classes were that wasted? Yeah. Yeah, so we have to consolidate, but what exactly does it mean when I say you have to consolidate? That's on the balance sheet. What, on the, what about the income statement? You take the portion of that income. Now, and this is where it gets messy. You act like you have 100% of the revenue. It, it makes completely no sense, but this is accounting. You take 100% of the revenues, 100% of the operating income. You might clean up towards the end of the income statement. But when I look at operating income, I'm counting 100% of the operating income of the subsidiary. Which means after I've done the valuation, I have some cleaning up to do, right? You see why? I've overcounted. I've got to clean up. So today we're going to talk about what accountants do to try to clean up. They don't do a very good job, but they try. So that's if I own 60% and I consolidate. Let me reframe the question. What if I own 10% of company B? And I do the same thing. I take cash, free cash for the firm, discount of the cost of capital, come up with the valuation. How much of the subsidiary have I counted in my valuation? I'll give you the choices. Maybe it's 0%, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 100% like I did for the consolidation. When I own 10% of a company, what do I end up counting if I take free cash for the firm and discount back at the cost of capital? Yes. The, forget the percentage. The percentages are slippery in accounting, but if you don't consolidate, if you own a minority stake in another company, none of their revenues get counted. None of the operating income gets counted. Below the operating income line, you will now show 10% of that company's net income or net loss, which means if you start with the operating income line, you haven't valued any of the subsidiary. I think there's more potential for making mistakes with cross holdings than any other aspect of valuation. You can see why, right? Sometimes you add, sometimes you subtract, sometimes you ignore. And today we're going to nail down when you add, when you subtract, when you ignore. One final question. You finish a discounted cash flow valuation. What does that mean? You take free cash for the firm, you discount back at the cost of capital. You come up with the value, you cleaned up for cash and cross holdings. And then you look around to see, is there anything I've missed in my valuation? So I'm going to throw out a few items and you tell me with each item, whether you'd add the item, subtract the item or ignore the item. What if your company has a headquarters building in New York City? JP Morgan, 277 Park. I think they own the building across the street too. Those buildings are probably worth a billion and a half. Can I add the billion and a half to my discounted cash flow valuation of JP Morgan? Sounds like I should, right? It's a valuable asset. Why would... But who's in those buildings? Traders and bankers. What do they do? They... Hey, whoever's on Zoom, if you could, if you could mute yourself, please. Well, essentially, you don't need really the building, right? Like like well, but they could work from home. But right now, they're in the building. You're counting their cash flows, and you're counting the building. We'll ask a question about whether this might be something that comes out of this this pandemic. But as long as they were working in the building and they pr produce the earnings and the cash flows and you value those cash flows, you can't count the cash flows and the asset in the same valuation. So if I'm an oil company, I might own refineries. I might own ships. But if I count the cash flows for me as an oil company, I can't count the refineries and the ships in the same valuation. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You either count the cash flows or you count the value. You can't do both. So let's use that principle. So question you're asking, anytime you look at an asset is, have I already built it into value with the headquarters building in New York City? The answer is yes. What if this company owns vacant land? Is, I don't even know whether there's vacant land in New York City. <laughs> okay. Yesterday I walked by Tompkins Square Park and maybe there's some vacant land there. 
Let's say your own vacant land. Would your answer be different then? Possibly, right? Because then you can say that's not being used for any of my operations. It's a something I own. It's an unutilized asset. We have no plans of ever utilizing. So you see the rule here? If you've already counted it, ignore it. But if you haven't counted, you're going to bring it in. Let's keep going. What if your company has patents? It's a pharmaceutical company. It has patents on a bunch of different drugs. And the accountants have put a number on the patent. They've told you how much the patents are worth. Can I add that value to my discounted cash flow valuation? You want to try? Use the, use the principle we had, no? it's already been counted. You, no. you think uh, those patents should be added on to my discounted cash flow valuation? Let me help you. Let me reframe the question. Have I counted the patents already in my cash flows? And if so, where? Where do the cash flows for a pharmaceutical company come from? From selling drugs, right? Why are you able to sell the drugs? Because you have a patent. So if you have patents, the patents are already in your cash flows. You can't add them on. Hi, that's what's going to be my next question. You did, so let's assume you've done the DCF valuation. You put in a growth rate in your cash flows, presumably. I'm going to ask you, where's that growth coming from? If it's coming just from existing drugs, then I'm going to say add the patent. But if it's coming from the expectation that you're going to have this blockbuster drug two years from now that you've just developed the patent on. So if it's been counted already, don't count it again. Now I'm going to come up with two accounting items. Accountants are becoming more ambitious, right? They want to put more stuff on the balance sheet. And one of the items that European companies already show is a brand name value. So many European companies, you look at the balance sheet, accountants have estimated a number that they call brand name value. So let's say you're valuing a consumer product company with some very good brand names. So it's Coca-Cola, you value the company, and then you go to the balance sheet, and the accountant says, brand name value of 50 billion. Can I add that 50 billion? So again, the question is, have I counted the brand name already? What do you think? Have I counted the brand name already? Yeah. Okay. And where did it show up? Probably in the national. And it showed up everywhere, right? Imagine Coca-Cola without its brand name. Its margins are 20%. Why not? Because it's soda tastes great. I mean, let's be real here. Bulk of its margins are coming from having that brand name power. It's already in the earnings. It's already in the cash flows. You can't add it on. One of my fears with what accountants are doing is you're going to see more and more of this double counting because people say it's brand name. I haven't dealt with it because you didn't explicitly ever put in brand name, right? So it's easy to miss. You can see why the double counting happens. What about Goodwill? This is an easy one. Let's slam dunk on this one. Should you ever add goodwill to a DCF valuation? What the heck is goodwill? The price paid, like over it's a plug variable, right? Think about it. Why does goodwill exist? It shows, first, it shows up only when you do an acquisition. I wish they didn't call it goodwill. You know why it sounds good? When something sounds good, people feel the urge to think there's something behind it. Goodwill is absolutely nothing, but we might as well call it X. Of course you shouldn't be adding it. And lastly, what if your CEO has been on a buying bench and what he's been buying a bunch of Picassos? Why? Because he likes Picassos. Oh, he threw it in. He also bought uh, uh, an apartment overlooking Central Park with the corporate money. And he got a helicopter to throw it in. You see where I'm going? If you collected assets along the way that are corporate assets, that have really nothing to do with the operations. You don't need a Picasso to sell sodas. You could argue that we should be adding those assets. But again, the rule is if it's already been counted in, don't count it. If it hasn't, then you have to figure out ways to bring it in. So we're, today we're going to talk about cash. We're going to talk about cross holdings. We're going to talk about other assets. So let's get the process started. So. So last session, we ended with terminal value. Any questions about the terminal value discussion? So basically go back and review the post that's central to doing valuation. So now I want to complete the DCF process by talking about hey, how do I design a DCF model to value a company? Now, before I do that, 
you're all welcome to use my Excel spreadsheet to value your companies because I don't want to be spending your time learning Excel as you're doing this class. But at some point, I think it's useful for you, perhaps not after this class, to build your own discounted cash flow model. So I'm going to give you some guidance on building a model. You know, what, you know, what choices you make. You think, you know, what are you talking about? Let's look at the, the choices you have to make when you build a discounted cash flow model. First, you have to pick a cash flow to discount. The cash flow can be dividends, it can be free cash flow equity, it can be to equity or the firm. So that's your first choice. Second, you've got to pick a discount rate to discount these cash flows. Cost of equity, cost of capital. Third, you've got to pick some kind of growth pattern. You know what I mean by growth pattern? You can have five years of growth and everything disappears and become a stable firm. You can have 10 years of growth. You can have five years of high growth and then a transition. Lots of different choices. So let's go through this process of how do you pick a cash flow, how do you pick up a discount rate, and how do you find a growth pattern that's, that best fits your company? If you already know your company, and you should because you picked a company, as you go through this process, I want you to think about your company. So here's your first fork in the road. Do you want to discount, do an equity valuation or a firm valuation? Remember I said you could value equity by taking cash flows to equity and discounting at the cost of equity or valuing the firm by taking cash flows of the firm and discounting at the cost of capital. So, you come to, so you're saying, which path do I take? I'll give you the drivers of what should determine that choice. If you're valuing a firm where it's only the equity you're focused on, because for whatever reason, the, you know, the debt is kind of an in and out number. It takes strategy and debt pays it off. Then maybe you lose equity valuation. If you have a company with stable leverage, you know what I mean by stable leverage, the debt ratio is pretty stable over time, 30%. The reason that helps is remember computing free cash flow equity is easier when I have a constant debt ratio, I can use the shortcut. But I'll tell you upfront that 90% of companies I value, my choice is gonna be firm valuation. It's much more general, leverage can change. In other words, it's much more forgiving of you changing your mind. So if you value the company at the 30% debt ratio, and then you say, you know what? I'm going to make the 30% go down to 10% over the next 10 years. It's easier to do when you value a firm than when you value equity. So this first fork in the road, and I know there are 350 people in this class, let's say the 350 companies. I would expect 90% of you, after you've looked at your company, to end up down the firm valuation road. And the remaining 10% down the equity valuation road. I'll give you a subset of companies where you have no choice but to go the equity valuation road. If you're valuing a bank or an investment bank or an insurance company, you have no choice but to value equity. And here's the reason. Remember we said with banks, debt is like raw material. It's not a source of capital. Even nailing down a number for debt is going to be a pain in the neck. So if you're valuing JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or all state insurance company, equity valuation is your only choice. There's not much you can do other than an equity valuation. So let's say you decide for your company because it's a bank or because it's a particular type of company, it's a utility, you decide to go the equity route. Then you face a second choice. You've decided to value the equity in the company. You can just look at the cash flows managers pay out and trust them, the dividend discount model. Or you can say, look, I don't trust managers. I'm going to estimate potential dividends. You think, which one should I pick? I'll save you the trouble. If you can estimate potential dividends, just do it, right? Because if it's roughly equal to dividends, you're not hurting yourself. You're getting the same value. And if it's not, you're getting a more realistic value using potential dividends rather than actual dividends. For the longest time, though, I took the lazy way out with banks and insurance companies and investment banks. When I came to this fork in the road, I said, look, you can't estimate free cash flows to equity for a bank. And here was my reasoning. Remember to get free cash flows to equity, you start with net income, then you subtract out net capex and then change in working capital. I challenge you to pick a bank and estimate net capex. I challenge you to pick a bank and estimate working capital. You can be spending the rest of your life trying to figure those out because it's not easy to do. In fact, it's not even be doable. Until 2008, every time I valued banks, I went the dividend. It was the only place I ended up using the dividend discount model. And it was because of desperation. I said, I can't estimate the free cash rate equity. But even with banks, I've changed my mind on this because, and the, and the year in which I changed should give you a sense of why I changed my mind. It was 2008. What did we learn in 2008? 
that banks are run by people who are not that sensible. And they don't always do the right thing. They don't return what they should. So since 2008, I've devised a way of estimating free cash flows to equity for a bank. And I'll talk about how to do it. But if you can estimate potential dividends, just go down that road. So if you're going to go equity valuation and you can get free cash flows to equity, just go the free cash flow to equity route. Dividend discount model should be your last resort. If I see a dividend discount model turned in as your DCF, I'm going to look for whatever reasoning you give as to why you ended up with dividends. And the reason can't be, I just started this valuation 20 minutes ago. I don't have time to do cash flows. Therefore, I sent you a dividend discount model. I'm just going to send it right back to you and say, look, once you've got about two hours or three hours to do this valuation, just do it right. So that's the first four, which cash flow. Second choice, what discount rate? This choice gets made for you when you estimated the cash flows. Let me explain. If you decided to estimate cash flows to equity, your discount rate has to be the cost of equity. If you decide to estimate pre-debt cash flows, the discount rate is the cost of capital. If you ask me what currency should I use to get the discount rate in? Hey, you estimated the cash flows. If the cash, cash flows are all in rubles, guess what? Your discount rate has to be in rubles. If your cash flows are in yours, so the discount rate choice is actually determined by a choice of cash flows. You tell me how you estimate cash flows. I can pick the discount rate that goes. With it. So you got the cash flows, you got the discount rate. You get ready to build the rest of the model. You want to build a growth pattern. Let's start with the easiest scenario. We have a company that is growing at 1% that you expect to keep growing at 1% forever. Your model's done, right? Because you have a stable growth company. You don't need to project out 10 years. And you can just do the terminal value equation. You can do it right now. You can get the value of equity. Today. Having said that, though, if you take a company that's already a stable company, like the one that I described, and you put in 10 years of cash flows and you value the company, your value will be exactly the same. So putting in a growth period on a mature company is not going to change value. It's just going to add this layer of estimation that it probably didn't need. But you can't get a different value just because you use 10 years of growth. The growth is all 1%. So if you have a mature company, don't go looking for trouble. You can just go into stable growth right away. But let's say you're valuing a company, Coca-Cola, McDonald's. And you get a growth rate of 5%. It's too high for a stable growth rate, right? And what is the comparison we make to make that judgment? How do we say a growth rate is too high to be a stable growth rate? What do we compare it to? Just compared to the risk-free rate, right? The risk-free rate is 2%. So if you're doing evaluation in Indonesian rupiah and the growth rate is 6% and you have a 5% growth rate, it could be a mature company, but in US dollars, 5% is just way too high. Clearly, you can't make the company a mature company today, but you might project that 5% growth rate for the next five years and say, at the end of year five, I think McDonald's is going to be a mature company and bring the growth rate down. It's called a two-stage model generically or allowing growth for a finite period, and then the growth rate drops up. The only problem is if your company is growing at 50%, this doesn't work that well, right? Can you imagine estimating 50% growth for the next 10 years, and then it goes to 1% in year 11? The world doesn't work that way. So if your growth rate is double digits, 18, 20, 25%, then you put in a transition period. None of these choices are theory choices. They're all pragmatic. So you have a 25% growth rate for the next five years, and you want to get to 1%, rather than go from 25 to one in one year, you might go 25, 20, 15, 10, five, and then 1% growth. Building an Excel spreadsheet is not a big deal, but you have to make sure you're building a spreadsheet that reflects the choice that you want to make. Now I'll tell you why I built this, my spreadsheet with a 10 year time horizon. I could have built five different spreadsheets. In fact, I have five different spreadsheets on my website, one for stable growth companies, one for two-stage models, one for three-stage models. Then I realized that people were just getting confused. They were trying to pick a model. And I said, if I wanted to devise one spreadsheet that I could use to value every company, I want to pick a growth period that's long enough to accommodate all these companies. That's why I picked the 10 years. And remember last session, I said 90% of companies have growth periods less than 10 years. If you have a mature company and you put it into my 10-year spreadsheet, you're still going to be okay because using a longer growth period, if you leave the growth rate at 1%, is not increasing your value or decreasing your value. So the 10-year growth period becomes this generic growth period. It doesn't mean your company is going to grow for the next 10 years. It could be the same growth rate for the next 10 years and beyond. But your value is essentially going to reflect the value you've got with the stable growth model. 
one way to think about what you're doing in the discounted cash flow model is if you ever played with Lego, it's like having three boxes of Legos that you're trying to put together to make one. So you take one out of the cash flow, one Lego out of the cash flow Lego box, one discount rate. Now, and the discount rate and cash flows have to fit. If it's cost of equity, you can't fit it with a, with, with a cap cash flow to the firm, and then one leg of piece out of the growth, put them together, you got a DCF model. The reason I say that is I've heard people say there are hundreds of discounted cash flow models. No, that's not true. There's one discounted cash flow model and hundreds of different ways you can present that model, right? So that's why when people say there are you know, aren't there dozens of ways of doing DCF, no, there's only one way of doing DCF, dozens of different ways in which you can end up with the cash flows and discount rates. And that's what these choices drive. So now let's move on to what I'm gonna call the loose ends in valuation. To set this up, let me give you a sense of how this part of the presentation was born. You know how acad academia works? I work incredibly hard. I have to teach like five hours a week for like 15 weeks. And, and then I get the summers off, you know. And then every, because I work so hard, every seventh year, I get the whole year off with pay. It's called a sabbatical. Don't let any professor tell you they have a hard life. This is the cushiest life ever. And usually in the sabbatical year, people have big plans. They're going to write books, they're going to do research. So because I've been teaching a long time, I've had multiple sabbaticals. In fact, I've missed a couple that I should lock up and take two years off. So this was in 2007, I decided to take a sabbatical. And my plan was to do absolutely nothing for a year. I wanted to get up every day for 365 days with nothing to do on my to-do list. So first day of my sabbatical, I decided to make this a ostentatious launch. So I went to Staples. I bought one of those to-do posters that you can get you hang on the wall. So I brought it home, put it right over the place in the, the, the room where I usually sit in my, at, at home. And my kids were all young enough then that they were at home, they were going to school. So one by one, they came down in the morning to go off to school. And as each of them came down, I'd point to my to-do list that the kids have nothing to do today. Piss them off no end because they had to go off to school. And then I made my fatal mistake. My wife came down the stairs and I said, "Hun, I have nothing to do today. She said, really, why don't you take the dog for a walk? Take the dog for a walk. I come back, there's something on my to-do list. So what is this? It says pick up bok choy at the grocery store. I make a confession. I didn't even know what bok choy was. <laughs> I was too embarrassed to ask. I'm walking around the grocery store. Is this in the livestock section? No, the meats? No. Finally, it turns out it's ugly looking cabbage. I find it and bring it home. It took me like an hour. And there's another item on my to-do list. And after about the fifth item on my to-do list from my wife, I said, you know what? I've got to find things to do to keep my wife off my list. Desperate. Almost... My, by coincidence, I get an email from the editor of CFA magazine. I didn't even know there was a magazine called the CFA magazine, or there's an editor for the magazine. But he said, would you be willing to write a little piece for us? And my normal reaction would have been, look, I want to have nothing to do for the next 365 days. Why would I do that? Then I re remembered that I needed something to do. So I said, okay. And I went to my to-do list and wrote in very big letters, write article for CFA magazine, cannot pick up bok choy kids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I did write the article. And I have to tell you, it's the only thing I've ever written that's got me hate mail. You know how difficult it is to get hate mail in valuation? People don't feel strongly enough. I've never had an email that says, I hate you for using bottom-up betas. But this got me hate mail. Part of the reason was, that, was the title of the article. It said, stop the garnishing. And I was talking about what people do after they claim they're done. Like what? The value company then add 20% for control, knock off 35% for liquidity, add 50. I said, if you're going to do this, you're going to end up with the number you wanted in the first place. It defeats the whole point. So I get like 3,000 hate mail emails. In fact, I created a smart mailbox looking for words that indicated hate. They all went and I removed them all from my emails. But one email actually came through and it actually made a good point. It said, look, if you think what we're doing in valuation is so wrong, why don't you come up with a better way of doing it? And he said, you know what? You're right. I have 11 months in my sabbatical left. 
here's what I'm going to do. Each month, I'm going to pick up a loose end, something that people had a premium or discount for. And I'm going to ask the question, if I were doing this right, how would I do it? Month one, I spent on control. What's value control? How would you value control if you don't want to put a 20%? Then a liquidity, then cash, then cross holdings. It kind of defeated my original object, which is to do nothing for a year. Those 11 months ended up becoming half of one of my books, where it's basically the loose edge. But I'm going to take what I found over those 11 months and try to compress the lessons by looking at a bunch of things. I'm going to start with cash. The rule in cash that every valuation book says is don't mess with it. You have 100 million in cash, just add the 100 million. I'm going to start by contesting that notion. Then I'm going to talk about cross holdings. In a perfect world, how would you value cross holdings? In the world we're in, what are the constraints in trying to do that? Then I want to talk about what other assets should I be adding on? I said, don't double count, but how do you make sure you're not double counting? I also want to talk about debt. We talked about debt in the context of cost of capital, all interest bearing debt and leases, but you also run into this item once you value the firm to get from firm value to equity value, right? You've got to subtract out debt. And at that stage, I want to stop and ask, is there anything else I should be netting up? And I want to be mysterious. What if your company has been targeted in a class action lawsuit? Your bear, you value the company. You know what's hanging over the bear valuation? About five years ago, Bear bought a company called Monsanto. Well, in fact, if I were making a list of the 10 worst acquisitions done of all time, this would be on that list. Because when Bear bought Monsanto, guess what they were buying with the company? Monsanto makes a product called Roundup, which is now the target of hundreds of lawsuits because it turns out it creates cancer. And if you walk, if you drive through suburban America, you see lawn after lawn, and guess what? Every lawn is treated with. If you're a landscaper, it's with Roundup, which means landscapers are facing huge rates of cancer because of Roundup. And then you have, of course, people walking on the land. Kids, you know, it's 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 a disaster. So when you're valuing bear, if you value after you valued it, you might subtract our debt, but you can't stop there. You got to bring in the expected effect of these lawsuits. Tobacco companies, this has been a reality for 50 years, right? We value a tobacco company. <laughs> so I'm gonna, and then finally, I want to talk about stock-based compensation. Until the 1980s, companies paid employees with cash. They pay, might give you a bonus, but it was good. But starting in the 80s, you started to see companies use options. In the 1990s, it took off with dot-com companies, which had no money, they paid with options. And now, of course, you got restricted stock units and stock-based compensation is now part of the game. I think equity research analysts do a horrendously bad job at stock-based compensation. We're gonna talk about what they do and why I think it doesn't make sense. But then we're gonna talk about how do we do this right? If you have a company where 10% of its expenses are stock-based compensation, how do we get that? So we have a lot on our plate. Let's start with cash. When you see cash and marketable securities on your company's balance sheet, if it's a US company or a European company, you can pretty much rest assured that that cash is invested in commercial paper and keywords. It's short-term, it's close to riskless, and it's very liquid, which also means that that cash is going to earn a low rate of return. And we already talked about why that by itself is not a problem. And if you think about how we deal with cash and valuation, in traditional discounted cash flow valuation, where you value the entire company, you value, you take free cash for the firm, you discount the cost of capital, then you add cash. Why? Because interest in from cash was not part of your free cash. So you have 200 million cash balance and just add 200 million on. If you do an equity valuation, things get murkier, right? Because you start with net income, God knows what you've already built in. But at least in traditional valuation, the rule has always been don't mess with cash. I'm going to contest that, even though it's something that you find in my book, don't mess with cash. I'm going to contest that with a very simple choice I want you to make. I'm going to point to you three companies. They look exactly the same in terms of enterprise value at cash, billion in enterprise value, 100 million cash. But here's where the companies are different. Two are developed market companies. Let's make them US companies. And one is an emerging market company. Let's make it an Argentine company. And here's also where they're different. Company has a history of earning a return on capital of 10%, which is roughly equal to the cost of capital. 
Company B has a history of earning a return on capital of 5% on its projects, its cost of capital is 10%. And company C has a history of earning a return on capital well in excess of its cost of capital. I'm gonna argue that in one of these three companies, cash is going to be a neutral asset. You know what I mean by a neutral asset? 100 million in cash is worth roughly 100 million. In one of these three companies, cash might actually be discounted by the market. And if that's the answer you give me, I want to know why. Why, why the discount? And one of these three companies, the market might actually attach a premium to the cash. Let's start with the easy choice here. In which of these three companies is cash most likely to be a neutral asset? And why? Which of these three companies is cash most likely to be a neutral asset? Yes. And what is it about company A that makes it a neutral asset? Takes zero net present value project. It's a block company. What I mean by a block company, block companies don't add value, they don't destroy value, they just run in place. In which of these three companies is cash most likely to be discounted and why? Yes. And what is it about B that scares you? But, but step back, when, when you see a company consistently take projects that earn less than the cost of capital, what does it tell you about the management of the company? They're pretty stupid. You're attaching a stupidity discount. Why? Because people don't stop being stupid overnight. If you have a company that's been badly run for a decade, it keeps taking bad projects, what makes you think they're gonna to stop tomorrow? So if you, have a, if you give a stupid manager $100 million, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna find something else stupid to do. And the more stupid they are, the bigger the discount is going to be. And in company C, you might actually have a premium. And to understand why, let's step back and think about utopian corporate finance. Utopian corporate finance, everything works well. The markets work perfectly. In utopian corporate finance, no company ever needs a cash balance. You know why? Because if I have a great project as a company, what do I assume the company should be able to do? Go to markets, raise capital, cost you nothing, go out and take the projects, everything. Now do you see why I put this project in Argentina? Just in the last 20 years, there have been at least five episodes in Argentina where the entire market is shut down because of a crisis. In fact, it's right now happening in Russia. What does this crisis mean? There's no way you're going to be able to, can you imagine a Russian company with a great project today? Where the heck are you going to go raise capital? Equity markets are shut down. Nobody's lending you money. The advantage of having a cash balance when you're worried about markets shutting down is that cash balance will not only let you survive the next crisis, but maybe even be a strategic weapon. You can buy other companies' assets for a fraction of what they're worth. You might attach a premium to the cash because it now becomes so let's be very clear in why we attach a discount to cash in company B. It's not because the cash earns a low rate of return, it's because the managers have a history of taking bad projects. Cash more than any other asset in the balance sheet rides on trust. If you trust the managers of a company, you let them hold big cash balance, you don't punish them. There's a reason why people are okay with Apple holding 200 billion in cash. It's a company that for a decade has fought off the temptation. Can you imagine how many investment bankers might be, might be outside one infinity loop trying to get Apple to buy company? And it hasn't fallen victim. There's a reason why Google is not punished for having 120 billion cash. It's a company with a history of delivering great returns. Conversely, if it's Hewlett Packard, you accumulate 10 million in cash. I want the cash back now because I've seen what you do with cash. When you have the cash, you do terrible acquisitions, you write off huge amounts. So when you discount cash, it's because you don't trust managers. Now, this might sound like a reach, right? You're saying, do investors discriminate this much across companies? I'll show you the results of a study. I mean, it's one of the most interesting, fascinating studies I've ever seen, where it looked across all US companies. It looked at cash balance at each company and asked a very simple question. How much is a dollar in cash in the hands of a company Price by the market. 
So these are 2,000 companies in the sample. You take the cash balance, you ask the question. I'll give you the good news first. Across all companies, a dollar in cash is valued at roughly a dollar. You see why that's good news? Because that's what we do in every discounted cash flow valuation, we add the entire cash balance. Here's the bad news. If you take mature companies with negative excess returns, what does that mean? Negative excess returns. Doesn't mean they're money losing, but they earn a return on capital less than the cost of capital, like company B. Take a look at what a dollar in cash is valued. It's valued at 69 cents. There's a 31% discount attached to cash because people don't trust you. You guys are familiar with activist investors like Carl Icahn and Bill Ack. We glorify them. We think they're amazing corporate finance geniuses. And Carl Icahn is not the deepest thinker on the face of the earth. I've said this before, but his basic sales pitch when he, when he takes over companies is, goes to companies, you have too much cash, give me the cash. That's basically the core of every sales pitch. Now, do you see why a Carl Icahn can generate value from some... Carl Icahn's big strength is he targets the right companies for the most part. Now, do you see why this company, when you target it, is an easy way to make money? Because all the company has to do to make the 31% discount go away is do what? Give the cash back. Dividends, buybacks. This is why activist investors target companies with big cash balances and a bad history where people don't trust them. The next company that gets targeted by an activist investor, take a look at the company, take a look at its returns, take a look at its cash balance, and you're gonna see the core of the argument. And finally, for companies like company C, which earn more than their cost of capital, a dollar in cash is actually valued at dollar twenty-two. When you see young growth companies with huge potential, and I'm an investor in this company. I want this company to have a big cash balance. You know why? Because I want this company to survive, to get all that glorious stuff. If it doesn't make it, then where is all that growth going to come from? It's going to let this company survive. And that's why in the late 90s, analysts used to come up with months or time, time over which you can burn off the cash. The longer you could go without having to go back to the market, the safer you were as a company. So cash balances can vary across companies, but how you treat them will depend on the company. Let's kind of extend this concept. Most companies, when you think about valuing them, have projects and assets and infrastructure and investing. You know, you have to estimate cash flows. But what if you have a company whose only assets are stocks and other publicly traded companies? They don't take projects, they just buy shares. That's what it looks like a mutual fund, right? That's what mutual funds do. These mutual funds are neat. They're called closed-end mutual funds. And here's how they work. You buy shares in the mutual fund. They're publicly traded. They don't buy shares in Coca-Cola and Kraft Heinz and, and Berkshire Hathaway and whatever else. If I gave you a company which owns seven publicly traded stocks, and I told you how many shares they own, and I said, what's the value of this company? Your response is going to be, so why am I valuing this company? I can see the market price. I'm going to multiply by the number of shares, I could come up with what I can get if I sold the shares today. So a closed end fund should be easy to value, it should trade roughly at whatever the value of what they hold is, right? But about 40 years ago, when finance first looked at closed end funds, they noticed something that the, I think the first person who looked at this was so shocked, they ran the study like five times to make sure they hadn't screwed up. They found that the typical closed end fund traded at a discount of about 15% on the value of the stocks on their portfolio. So if you have a closed in fund with $100 million in marketable securities, instead of trading at 100 million, traded at 85 million. In fact, it was called the closed in fund puzzle. You know why they called it a puzzle? Because it looked like there should be an easy way to make money here, right? What should you be able to do in this closed in fund? If it's trade, sorry, what? You should be able to redeem. You should be able to buy the entire fund. It's a publicly traded fund. Buy the entire fund. Redeeming it is just going to give you a share. Remember, it's a publicly traded stock. You can't redeem. You'd have to sell your shares and you're going to get the 85% still. You have to take over the whole closed in fund for 85 million. You can't asset you'd have to sell all of the assets. You'd have to liquidate the company and collect 100 million. So the, part, the reason they use the word puzzle is how come that's not happening? And there were practical reasons why it was. One is many of these funds were headquartered in parts of the world where 
taking over the funds, Cayman Islands, parts of the Caribbean, but taking over the funds was hugely difficult. Second, if you did take over the fund and you liquidated their holdings, you faced a cost. Why don't you get to keep the entire 100 million? If you take over a company which has $100 million in stocks, the market value, and you sell them for 100 million, what's the cost you guys? One is liquidity. They are not lie heavily fallen stocks trying to get rid of them. But even if you could sell them at market value, taxes. you have to pay taxes, right? Because remember, you don't get to keep the 100 million. You have to pay capital gains taxes because if you bought these stocks at 40 million, they've gone up to 100 million. So for whatever reason, closed in funds continue to trade at a discount for the most part. But if you look across closed in funds, some traded big discounts. Some traded small discounts, some traded par, and some trade above par. In other words, they traded a premium. The question is, what makes them different? I think the answer lies in what we talked about with cash, right? Which is, you know, we looked at what kind of returns do you make on it. If you have a closed-in fund run by a fund manager, that is terrible. You know what I mean by terrible, right? They've been consistently on four percent less in the market. You know what you're going to do, right? You're going to discount that closed-in fund, not because of what they have in the balance sheet, but because you expect this guy to keep picking bad stocks. I'm just waiting for Kathy Woods' ARC funds to trade at a discount, right? At some point in time, you're going to say, why am I handing over money to this woman who keeps buying stocks without even thinking about what they're doing? But if you have a manager who's a superstar manager running a fund, what will you do? You're going to pay a premium. So I'm going to give you an example of what I think is the best known closed end fund in the world, though you don't think of it as such. It's Berkshire Hathaway. Berkshire Hathaway, of course, is Warren Buffett's, the company is built up. Where does it get its capital? It gets it from Geico, an insurance company. And let's face it, we've all seen the Geico ads, amazing ads. But it's, an, it's a really well-run insurance company. If you think about valuing an insurance company, there are two pieces to value. One is how good are you as an insurance company? What does that mean? Well, if you pick the right markets to go after, you set premiums right, you collect the difference, you can be a really good insurance company. And Geico is a very good insurance company. That's half of the year. The other half is what do you do with all those premiums you collect? Because remember, insurance companies, they collect premiums, invest those premiums, usually in the market. Most insurance companies, the first half is what drives value. They're, they're good insurance companies. They, their money management skills are pretty average. But in the case of Berkshire Hathaway, you got Geico, a really good insurance company, twinned with perhaps the greatest money manager in history. Warren Buffett investing your money. And guess what? For the bulk of Berkshire Hathaway's life, it's traded at a premium. What I mean by premium, if you look at the price to book ratio of Berkshire Hathaway and compare it to the price to book ratio of a typical insurance company. In the late nineties, Berkshire Hathaway used to trade at twice the price to book of a typical insurance company. So Warren Buffett premium. But that premium seems to have almost completely disappeared over the last 20 years. So I have a question. Why has the Warren Buffett premium melted away over the last 20 years. Yeah. Oh, because, well, I would say two things. The uh, his like returns above market have like decreased and also he's also getting very old. I think first is he's become an average investor. Over the last 20 years, Warren Buffett has been a pretty average investor. He's had a win here and a win there. But this isn't like 1963 to 2000 where you could look at him and say, that's amazing. You can't, you know, that, that, that's extraordinary. He's become more ordinary. But the other, is he's 90 years old. In fact, seven years ago, he came out, and this is what amazes me when equity research analysts look at any time Berkshire Hathaway buys a stock. What's the headline you see? Buffett expands position in Occidental. Two years ago, Buffett buys Snowflake. Yeah, I'll make, I'll, like, yes. yeah. <laughs> no. But I think that the key that you got to think about here is when you're looking at that premium, markets being realistic, saying, look, even if he's picking stocks, he's 90 years old. I, I, and I'm not making anything that none of you, that, that, that people don't know. He is going to die one day. This is not news, right? He, and markets building that in. 
So when you think about closed in funds, it's, you know, the cash balance and how we attach premiums and discounts, it can expand to your understanding of closed in funds. And it can also affect how you think about companies like SoftBank. Masahiro Son, for the longest time, was viewed as a legendary investor, visionary, right? 300 year plan. That was three years ago. <laughs> People paid a premium for SoftBank because you were getting Masahiro's you know, investment acumen. What changed? Well, yet we work, and then you saw, you know, today you, you read the news about better.com. This is the guy, the CEO, actually on Zoom fired 90 people. Yeah. Yeah. A guy called Vishal Garg, but I'll tell you some background that'll make you a little ashamed of coming to Stern. You know where he went to school? Stern. <laughs> he was a Stern undergraduate. Of yeah. 2015, I said, so go back and look. He's, a, he's probably a smart guy, but it, he sounds a little sociopathic to me. I mean, it's a just, I mean, how do you not think through these things? But that's a big soft bank investment. So when you talk about closed in funds, that's what I want you to pack. Now let's talk about cross holdings. I think what makes cross holdings tricky is there are three different ways in which accountants record cross holdings. If you own 5% of another company and you take absolutely no role in how the companies run, it's called a minority passive investment. If you have a minority passive investment, here's what you're required to do. In your income statement, you have to show whatever dividends you receive from that holding, just dividends. So if, if your cross holding pays no dividends, it's not, it won't even show up in the income statement. And on the balance sheet, you have to show what you originally invested to get that cross holding. It's like original book value. So if you invested, so for instance, there's a company called, uh, if, if you look across the people, companies that invested in Tencent when it was a young private company, Process and, uh, and a couple of other companies, the South African company, I forget its name right now, that, it, that did the same. And if you look at their balance sheet, you'll often see what they originally invested. It's not mark to market. So basically you see the original investment. That's minority pass, completely disconnected from reality. The second type of cross holding you can have is a minority active investment. What is that? You own 15% of another company, you take some role. You have a director on the board, you have some say in the management. Here's what you're required to do. In your income statement, you have to show 15% of the net income or net loss that you get from that holding because you own the 15%, but it shows up below the operating income line. 90% of minority holdings are minority active holdings. You're going to see the line, but it's going to show up below operating. And then if you own 50, 55 or 60%, accountants flip out. They make you consolidate. And I've never understood the logic of it. And here's, here's how it goes. When I sit down to my, do my income statement, they ask me to count 100% of the revenues in the subsidiary. And I say, look, I own only 60%. They say, don't worry about it. When you get to the operating income, they ask me to count 100%. I say, I own only 60%. Don't worry about it. When I get to the balance sheet, they ask me to count 100% of the cash, 100% of the assets. Each stage, I own only 60%. So don't worry about it. In the last stage, they wake up and say, but you own only 60%. So that's what I've been trying to tell you all this time. You don't own 40% exactly. So you know what accountants record to show the 40% that doesn't belong to you? What will you see on a balance sheet that tells you? that there is a subsidiary that's been consolidated, but you're on 100%. It goes by one of two names, yeah. Minority one is minority interest, also called non-controlling interest. It'll always show up on the liability side. And what it reflects is the value of the 40%, at least according to accountants, that doesn't belong to you. Now do you see why cross holdings give people trouble? Because the first thing you need to understand about cross holdings is how have the accountants recorded that cross holding. So let's start with a very simple example so you can see the layers built to value cross holdings. Let's say you value company. Company A using consolidated financials, you get free cash from the firm, you discounted the cost of capital, you come up with a billion dollars as present value. It's a value of the firm. The company has 200 million in net debt, you subtract it out, value of equity is 800 million, right? So I'll do that first part for you. And then I said, oh God, I forgot something. What did I forget? I forgot that company A owns 10% of company B and it's a minority holding. Company B trades at 500 million, it's publicly traded. So here's my question, 10% of 500 million is 50 million. 
So I'm going to offer you three choices. My value was 800 million before I threw this piece of information in. Should I add the 50 million, subtract the 50 million, or ignore the 50 million? What do you think? What's the question you need to answer? Have I already valued that cross holding, right? Have I? What did I use? Free cash for the firm that comes from operating income. This is a minority holding, and we said the income from minority investment shows up below the operating income line. I haven't valued company B yet. So guess what I need to do? I need to bring it in explicitly because it's not been valued yet. So I'm going to take the 800 million and add 50 million. Hang in there with me because I'm not quite done. I said, oh, by the way, I also forgot another thing. They own 40, 60% of company C, and that's what was fully consolidated. And remember what I said, when you consolidate something, the accountants try to be helpful and put in this non-controlling or minority interest in the balance sheet. And I said, the minority interest in this case is 40 million. So here again, I'm going to give you three choices. At 800 plus 50, 850, do I add the 40 million, subtract the 40 million, or ignore the 40 million? What do you think? Subtract, subtract and tell me why. Because I did a consolidated, when you do consolidate, you count it 100%. Follow this rule because otherwise you're going to get lost. You're going to be adding things you're going to be, you shouldn't be adding and subtract things you shouldn't. My value here is going to be 810 million, 800 plus 50 minus 40. But let me be quite honest, this is a complete mess I've created, right? The 800 million was an intrinsic valuation. Where did the 50 million come from? The market, it's a pricing. Where did the 40 million come from? The balance sheet, it's a book value. I've taken an intrinsic value of pricing and a book value and I've thrown it all in. This is how accountants deal with minority interests and holdings in other companies. And it's not, you see, you're messing up your intrinsic valuation. You might do it because it's a small holding, but you can see very quickly how this could get out of control. So in a perfect world, what would you like to do? If I gave you this company to value, you'd value company A, then you'd value company B. You do an intrinsic valuation of all three companies, right? You don't trust the market, you don't trust accountants. And let's say I told you that the values I came up with as intrinsic values for company B and C were both 250 million. Do you see how my answer is gonna be different? Let's start with 800, like I did before. But now what's, what am I going to add for my minority holding? 10% off, 250 million, it's 825. And then what do I subtract out to get rid of my, the 40% that doesn't belong to me? I take 40% of 250 million, which is 100. So it'll be 800 plus 25 minus 100, which would give me an intrinsic value of 725 million. I know it's a lot of stuff adding, subtracting. Think through the logic of each step though. Now you can see why cross holdings are such a pain in the neck. So I'll give you, tell you how I would approach valuing cross holdings in a perfect world, in a, perf in, a, in a world where I had access to everything I needed. I'd ask for full financial statements for each of the subsidiaries. I'd also ask the, 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 con the company with the consolidated financials, for what I call parent financials. Much of the world, companies which have consolidation will report a pair, not, not everywhere, but in most parts of the world, you'll have parent-only financials and consolidated financials. If I want to do this right, I will value the parent company as a standalone company. I'd value each subsidiary separately with an intrinsic valuation, and then add them all up. This is, if you truly want to do intrinsic valuation, that's the way to do it. So I know it sounds abstract, so let me try it on a real company. You're all familiar with Yahoo, right? Search engine, you know, it's faded, the company itself had gone. But it was, a, it was a huge success story in the late 90s. Started in 92 by 99, $100 billion. Its glory days lasted about four years, then Google came along and it went through a long slide, essentially. So this was a valuation I did of Yahoo in 2000, and the year that Alibaba went public, 2014 maybe, middle of 2014. It was about two years after Marissa Meyer had been brought in from Google to run the company with a lot of fanfare. But she came with a great pedigree, right? One of the early employees in Google had built up the you know, parts of Google, so they brought her in and they gave her a mission. Be Steve Jobs. That's ba the basic mission. They wanted her to convert Yahoo into this giant success. 
And I thought it was incredibly unfair, that mission. And I'll tell you why. I valued Yahoo's parent as a parent company. Basically, I went and valued its operating assets. So operating income, cash flows. And let's face it, the value is not very high because by 2013, it had lost the battle. There was no way it was going to win it back. Google had won. It was now a small share search engine with you know, a few old Yahoo email accounts. 7.4 billion. That was my optimistic valuation of Yahoo and intrinsic valuation. But Yahoo had two holdings in 2014 that were of immense value. One was 35% of Yahoo Japan, which was a standalone publicly traded company. And that 35%, I valued it about not a, So in fact, I doubled the value by bringing in that cross holding. But here's the even bigger holding. They own 22.1% of Alibaba. And this was at the verge of Alibaba going public. And I'd done an IPO valuation of Alibaba, and you add the 22% of that value, you get another. So you got seven and a half billion plus seven and a half plus 32 billion. You see where I'm going next? Almost 65% of Yahoo's value is coming from its Alibaba holding. Now you see why Marissa Maya could never have turned Yahoo around. Basically, she controlled the rump of a company. Basically, the Yahoo as, as a company was worth was worth a fraction of what Alibaba, the Alibaba holding was. On any given day, what happened at Yahoo was determined more by what Jack Ma was doing at Alibaba than what Marissa Meyer could do at Yahoo. And of course she tried, she spent a few billion dollars trying. And finally in 2015, everybody threw up their hands and Yahoo ended as a company. The name might be, might be still around, the search engine might be still around, but its days as a standalone company are gone. Here I was able to do an intrinsic valuation of Yahoo, Yahoo Japan, and Alibaba. But I was able to do it only in 2014. I couldn't have done it in 2013. You know why? Because Alibaba was still a private company then. I could not get access. I had to wait for the prospectus to be filed for Alibaba's IPO before I could do it. But this is what you need to do when you want to do cross holdings, right? But it does require an immense amount of work. So in a perfect world, you'd ask for financials in every company. You do a full valuation of each company, and then you sum up the valuations. But we don't live in a perfect world. And I'll tell you a story to illustrate why it's so difficult to do valuation right when you have a lot of cross holdings. Late 90s, I think it was 99, I was doing a second edition or a third edition of one of my valuation books. And I was valuing a Japanese company late 90s, we valued the Japanese company, you always teetered on the edge of disaster because the risk-free rate in the end was so much lower than the rest of the world. If you're not careful, it blew up. But I was careful, I finished my valuation. I'm patting myself on the back when I take a look at the annual report and the Japanese company says it has 227 cross holdings. You see my path is laid out for me, right? If I want to do this right, I have to value 227 other companies. I am too lazy to do that. But even if I'd chosen to do that, I couldn't have because 167 of those companies were private with no information. I called the investment relations officer of the Japanese company and I said, you know what? I'm valuing a company. It's not for an expose. I just need the information for a valuation that I'm doing in my book. And she said, I cannot give you that information. I said, why not? She said, it's proprietary. I said, okay. What if I bought a thousand shares in your company and then called you? She said, still be proprietary. I said, let me get this straight. I'd be part owner of your company and you're refusing to tell me what I own. She thought about it for a moment. She said, you have a point, but it's still proprietary. At this stage, I'm whacking my head against a brick wall. I get ready to hang up the phone. She says, wait, wait, I do have something I can tell you about these cross orders. So wait, hoping that she'll give me some revenues or operating income. She said, I cannot give you specifics, but I have to tell you that these cross holdings are worth a lot. I said, I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here in front of an Excel spreadsheet. I have cross holdings. I have a cell. I've entered LOT there. I'm getting errors all over the place. Can you tell me how many zeros there are in a lot? She didn't answer, but it cuts to the heart of the cross holding culture, right? Because what do managers do? They hold up a brown paper bag that trust me, it's full of cash. I say, can I look in the bag? No, let me take my word for it. Because that's what you get with the cross holding company, right? They tell you what the cross holdings are worth. They want you to take them at their word. 
And as long as you take them at the word, why are they ever going to give you information about those cross holdings? We get the companies we deserve. For the longest time, Indian investors would complain to me about these cross holdings and you know, how family groups would not reveal the cross holding. I said, there's a very simple fix for that. Start attaching a value of zero to any cross holdings that you cannot see. And you'll be amazed at how quickly information will start to come up about these cross holdings because they want to convince you it's not zero. So in the real world, the problem you often face is you're not, you don't have the information. So I'll give you the approximations I use for companies where I cannot get the information in an intrinsic valuation. For the 160 private companies this Japanese company owned, I knew what sector the holdings were in and I knew the book value. So here was my approximation. If you go to my website, I report price to book ratios by sector. So let's say you own, you have a cross holding in a chemical company and it's $100 million book value. A typical chemical company trades at 1.3 times book value. Fill in the rest. What am I going to use as the estimated value? 1.3 times 100 million is 130 million. So for companies that are not publicly traded, I use that price to book ratio. And if you have a lot of cross holdings and many of them are publicly traded, I'm going to be sloppy. I'm going to take the market value and go with it because I don't want to value 60 companies to value one company. In fact, for Yahoo, I did a pricing of the pieces. You know what I mean by that? I took Yahoo Japan, Yahoo US, did a, you know, used an EV to say. So with each one, I used a revenue multiple to come up with an estimate. This is a pure pricing. So when you have a cross holding company, you can price each part. And I built in that. So when you decide to value a company with lots of cross holdings, if you want to do a true intrinsic valuation, it is a lot of work. But in some cases, you have no choice. You cannot value SoftBank without valuing Alibaba. You know why? Because 30% of SoftBank's value comes from its holding of Alibaba. You cannot value Process, European company, without valuing Tencent. Because 80% of Process's value comes from its Tencent holding. In fact, you can buy Tencent at a discount by buying Process. You have to bring in those values and do them right. Let's do one final piece before we end for the spring break. So you've done your discounted cash flow valuation. And I gave you the rule, you can't double count an asset. Let's think about things that you might be counting. One is the late 90s used to have overfunded pension plans. You know, you know how pension plans work, right? Most companies now in the US have defined contribution plans. What does that mean? Basically, they collect your money, they will invest the money, and if it does well, you'll get a lot of pension. If it doesn't, so basically they take on no risk. But in the 20th century, a lot of companies had defined benefit plans. What does that mean? The company promises a fixed pension. It then invests your money, collects money from you, invests it in stocks. If stocks do really well then, what you have as pension assets can exceed what you owe in pension liability. That's what an overfunded plan is. Technically, that difference belongs to shareholders and a lot of analysts used to add that up. And then we talked about the example of vacant land, unutilized assets. But let's get some creative and let's think about assets that you might want to add on to your DCF valuation. I'll give you the most outlandish example I can think of. Do you heard of the Michael Price Fund? Michael Price about 20 years ago gave, I think, 10, 15 million dollars for MBAs to manage on a yearly basis, stern MBAs to manage. In fact, the only time I've ever asked for money for the school, I hate asking for money in the first place. I hate asking money for a university even more. But I don't know what pressure they put on me, but I went and I was part of the team that got the money. So for the last 20 years, MBAs have managed the fund. And each year about 10 MBAs joined that group. They, you know, they managed it for a year, then they turned it over to the next class. I have zero official role in this fund, but because these MBAs have to do pitches where they pick a stock and they pitch it to the others, and many of them are in my valuation class, they come to me and guess who they test out the pitch? You know, what do you think about this? So about 10, 15 years ago, I think 2007 or eight, one of the MBAs running the Michael Price Fund shows up in my office. He says, I'm, I'm facing a conundrum. I very quickly turned to my computer, typed in the word conundrum. Turned out he was confused. Now I didn't even know why he used it. But I liked the word. I decided to use it backwards. So what's your conundrum? He said, I'm valuing Playboys. 
I said, I don't see a conundrum yet. He says, I come up with a value of 240 million, the stock's trading at 280 million. I said, I still don't see a conundrum, don't buy the stock. He said, here's my conundrum. See how many times we use the word conundrum in like minute and a half? He said, there is one very valuable asset that Playboy owns that I haven't counted in the 240 million. Does anybody know what he was talking about? It's not the brand name, it's not the bunnies, it's not the... It's the Playboy Mansion. If you ever go to LA and you take one of those tourists, you know, they take you around, they show you. One of the things they'll show you is the Playboy Mansion. This huge property. It peak LA, you know, so it's like Brentwood and Bel Air, so. Worth about 150 million in 2007. You see why? This guy, the conundrum, right? You take the 240 million, Playboy, the company owns the Playboy mansion. You add the 150 million, it becomes undervalued. So, so his question was, can I just add the 150 million? This one small catch, right? There's an 80 year old in a bathrobe hanging out in that mansion that you can't exactly throw out on the street. Hugh Hefner still lived in the mansion. So he asked me, what should I do? I said, look up the actuarial tables. So what am I looking for? Look to see how long 80 year olds who surround themselves with 26 year old playmates live. That's a lot of stress on your heart. Maybe five years. Then what do you do? You take the 150 million and take it. You, you, if you want, you can take real estate costs of capital, estimate a value five years out, discount it back five years and add it on. Then I forgot all about this conversation. Until a few years later, I open up the Wall Street Journal and I see a story. Remember I said, you can't have your cake and eat it too. I was lying. Playboy actually had its cake and ate it too. And here's what it did. It sold the mansion to this Greek, whatever, Darren Metropolis with Hugh Hefner in it. I'm not kidding. <laughs> he bought the mansion and the basic contract said, as long as Hefner stayed alive, he couldn't move in. And when he died, and Playboy made $200 million selling the mansion with Hefner in it. Be creative. You know, you can count only the cash flows of value, but sometimes by being creative, you can claim the difference. In fact, I talked about the headquarters building in New York. Let's say you're the bank that owns the headquarters building. Real estate prices are soaring. 250 million, 300 million, 500 million. Is there a way? You need the building still for your bankers and traders. Is there a way you can take advantage of the pricing and still use the building? A lot of, a lot of companies did this in, in the last housing boom. Yeah. They, sell, they, they did a sale and a lease back. For that to work, the lease, uh, lease levels should, should, if they keep track with the price, then you're stuck. But often when you're pricing soar in, in housing, the rent, doesn't soar as much as the level of the house. So basically they took advantage of it. But the rule is don't double count. So when you look at a balance sheet, and if you have a scenario where the real estate on which the company is sitting is getting so valuable that it's actually worth more than the asset, you face a choice. And across Asia, any real estate-based company, I valued an Indonesian plantation company a couple of years ago. The real estate on which the plantations were was worth three times what the plantations were worth as, you know, as a business. Almost any luxury hotel company in the world now, the real estate is worth more than the company as a hotel business. Which means as an investor, you got to decide, are you investing in a hotel business or are you investing in real estate? And it's a very different game you're investing in real estate. So it's, it's, it's going to come back as you value your company. Maybe there'll be assets where you stop and ask, Maybe this asset is worth more to somebody else. And on, on, on this final note, COVID might actually create a question for many companies. You see why? You know, companies maintain these big buildings. They own the buildings. They're paying hundreds of millions of dollars. And with COVID, if you can keep two-thirds of your, you don't have, everybody doesn't have to stay home, right? But two-thirds of your people can stay at home. You know? And that is, that is really bad news for commercial real estate. Because collectively, who's going to fill up all those spaces? I haven't seen the adjustment in pricing yet. But this is the other shoe waiting to drop is how is that going to play out in terms of pricing and valuations? 
I'm going to end there and I will see you after the break. Have a fun break and see you on a week from Monday. Yes. I have a friend who works at Stripe. Yep. And I asked her.